And then in 1970, uh, that base was almost, it was, uh, they was closing a lot of bases at that time. And Fort Irwin was one of them, so uh, myself and a, a lot of other GR people went to Vietnam. Uh, and that was in uh, June of 1970. We usually uh, worked at least 12 to 15 hour shifts, and naturally that was seven days a week. And, and you do get to the point where you don't know which day it is anymore because you're so tired. You're under a lot of strain and trying to get everything right because I don't think there was a, a young man brought back. And that wasn't positively identified. You know, when he got back home and they opened up the casket, I don't think there was ever, ever an a, a instance where it's the, they said, that's not my son. They were positively identified. You know, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a doubt in anybody's mind that this was their boy. You can't imagine what weapons of war are due to a human body. I know Bill experienced the pain, but I mean, no hands, no feet, no holes blown over, everything, a grenade goes off or mortar around. I mean, it's one of the most horrific things you've ever seen. Whenever guys got into a firefight or a helicopter went down or planes went down or, or F-14s or whatever, you know, the GR units would go out and recover that body if they weren't brought in by the people that were in the firefight. Mostly all the time the wounded was brought in, but there was a lot of situations that they didn't bring the deceased back because it was too hot. Anyhow, when they declared it was safe for the GR to go in, if that, if that was a situation, you know, well then GR units went in and, re, and brought the bodies back to a uh, mortuary, and there were two mortuaries in Vietnam. Uh, there was one in Da Nang, and there was one right outside of Saigon at Tan Sanuk. And I was, I was headquartered out of Tan Sanuk. What we did there as taken remains from the field back into Tonsonute, we would positively identify that remains. And anything that you picked up, I know this sounds gross, but anything that you picked up, it just slid right off the bone. So you just grabbed up things with rubber gloves as best you could, and you tried to keep your parts together and put it in body bags and bring it on back and then do, uh, all the work when you got back to the, the mortuary. But the uh, skin slipping in, it, it's, it's the worst stench, you know, you, you can imagine. And what a lot of people don't understand uh, in that process, you know, you always heard of the dog tag thing. Well, the dog tags really didn't mean a whole lot. That's, that's more movie stuff than anything. Everybody had a dog tag, you know, but you didn't rely upon a dog tag at all for identification. It was just another piece of the puzzle is all it really amounted to. When you went into the military, you were fingerprinted, of course, and you were, you were, your teeth were charted. Uh, and, and that's how we, we positively identified uh, soldiers that came in. The notch in the dog tag was back in World War II. They, they would take that notch and put it between the teeth okay right there or down here and then ram that that uh the lower mandible up and so or that dog tag would would stick in and that's how when they left those remains they had something there for identification we positively identified these guys as they come in the first thing it was a, it was staging like military is big on you know steps the first staging area, uh, would we would would chart any identifying marks that this person had, like scars or molds or anything, anything unusual, tattoos and so forth. And then they would go through uh, the dental staging area, and then through uh, the fingerprinting area, and then the footprinting area, because all airmen, in addition to be 
fingerprinted, they were also footprinted also. Because like when a Huey went down or a C-130 or a F-14 or something like that, there wasn't a whole lot left. And so what you dealt with was a lot of times was just body parts. You didn't deal with a whole body. And so you just tried to get something, you know. After, the, after we did everything as far as identification, then it went to the embalming area. And then every remains was bombed prior to leaving Vietnam. And then we went ahead and uh, uh, we, we packed those remains in a uh, kind of a, n not totally packed, but we, in a, uh, uh, a preservative, and we put them in plastic and put them in a container and, and sent them home here to the States. And there was, and they usually came into uh, Oakland, California. And then from there, they you know, brought home for a military funeral. Ours was a, a, a just a, it was a service that the American people was going to demand from the government for having their boys over there. And uh, there's where we helped pick up that, that slack in, in trying to bring some closure to the people that their sons had given everything. A lot of our young people, and you know, I say young people, and probably middle-aged people, I can group them in with that, and maybe older people too. They've never had to sacrifice. So, and, and I think just sacrificing a little bit for how good we have it over here would be a good thing. I think when, when, a, when a young lady or a young man gets out of high school nowadays, or maybe out of college, I think they ought to give something back to the country. Maybe six months or three months. They ought to perform some type of civil service in some kind of way, something for their country. You don't have any idea until you're in a third world uh, how good we have it. So freedom to me is uh, it's above everything else. You can't have, none, all, none of this is possible without freedom. This country is the, is the last hope for freedom. If, if, you don't, if you can't do it here, where are you gonna do it, right? You know, I fly a flag at my home almost every day. It was, um, I don't want to say a special time in my life, but it was uh, something that I'm glad I did. <laughs>